communication via words, the art of words is always, always going to look like failure to readers and feel like failure to authors if the message intended or the message received is not the same. I I hope this makes sense. Because writing is such a personal, fillet yourself open process, um, it is no wonder that not everybody is going to get it. I'm here to tell you I can go into a 12-step room and I can share an experience and the overarching gist of it, everybody can get. Welcome to Amy Liz Harrison's podcast, Eternally Amy, a mum of eight's journey from jail to joy, a Gen Xer who overcame her struggle with alcohol to become a best-selling author and mental health advocate. She shares stories of hope and offers ideas for others struggling with mental health challenges. One thing is for sure, you'll leave with something to chew on. And now, here's your host, Amy Liz Harrison. Greetings, compadres. Okay, so I want to start this off by saying that there is no real set plan at all for this rambling mess that is about to occur. Um, It's going to be a waterfall with some quotes of my thoughts. (laughs) Um, And what I'd like to talk about today is a book I first read about a year ago, and it is called On Writing and Failure by Stephen Marsh, who is an author living in Toronto and very well respected author that I can, as far as I can see, um, and has written for, you know, The Atlantic, The Guardian, New York Times, all of that, and writes this novel. It's not a novel. Maybe it is. It's a book called On Writing and Failure. Now, I first heard of this book through my fellow author friend, Ted Neal, and he and I write completely different genres, and he's a wonderful friend who, like, gets it, gets the pain slash the agony slash the mixed up kind of why am I doing this with I have to do this kind of thing that all writers go through, as far as I can tell, um, and all artists to some degree. And the reason I'm talking about this now, and I may may very well do a series on this this year. I'm not sure. Okay, we don't know. But these are my random thoughts today because... Over the weekend, I had some negative reviews come in about books in the Kiss Your Brain series. And the Kiss Your Brain series is supposed to be a series for children that helps children identify. It's supposed to make them feel seen, okay? It is a series where kids who have a parent who's depressed, maybe a loved one going through an eating disorder, um, a loved one getting sober, what that child sees. So when a real life child picks up one of those books, that real life child can read, oh, this character sees a lot of the same stuff that I see. Now, Of course, this is because my kids, when I got sober in 2011, were in the car with me when I got my DUI. So it's a perspective that adults might not fully understand because adults are the one facing these giant issues. And the series is told through a child's viewpoint, okay? So, but here, here's the thing. Because my creative process and my creative brain is a little weird, I have some Easter eggs in there that are like for the adults, right? So for example, in one of the books, the child is at an old folks home and the child overhears some senior citizens making comments about different things. There are these little speech bubbles in the artwork, right? And one of them says, I don't have it in front of me, but something like, like Mary Magdalene sweating in church, right? And these are supposed to be old school things that a senior citizen today in 2024 might say to another senior citizen. 
Okay. And so it doesn't really like matter that the child doesn't get it. It's not germane to the story at all. However, if you're an adult reading the story to a child and you're Gen X or North, you might understand why a senior citizen would say that. And you might not. And that is the point, right? That is the point that I'm trying to make is that I am not, I am not currently right for everybody else to understand the nuances of every single thing that I'm saying, all right? If you don't understand it, it's kind of not my problem. Does that make sense? It's kind of not my issue. And it says more about the reader, really, than it does about me. And, you know, there have been plenty of books that I have read that I have not understood. And I don't think that that makes the author dumb or like a bad person. And I'm not saying anybody said that about me. I'm just saying, you know, if I were to sit down today and read a Civil War novel, um, I'm not positive that I would really understand what was going on. And so if somebody who reads this is not in the mental health space, has not had the experience of being a child, watching an adult go through this, you're not going to get it. Like, it's not for you. It is just not for you. And even if you are in the mental health space, and even if you were a child who, similarly to the children in the Kiss Your Book series, saw an adult or a loved one going through a difficult time, you may not really get it either. And that is okay, because I can't control anybody's reaction or understanding. If I have meaning inside my head or a certain message that I'm trying to communicate or convey, and I fail at that, I fail at communicating exactly what I'm thinking inside my head, exactly what I'm trying to say, then I I don't really see that anymore as a my problem. I really don't, because the thing about it is, is it's like the car accident analogy that many of us are used to seeing or reading about. You know, if a car accident occurs, this person who's standing on this side of the street at this angle will have seen this and will explain the accident from their perspective and their vantage point. The red light camera may be recording, you know, another perspective that's like from overhead. And then there's an Another perspective. I mean, we see this all the time in instant replays for sporting events, right? Um, we have to look at all these different camera angles. As a reader, we're not privy to all those different angles because we're privy to our angle, our lens, based on what we've been through, based on what we've experienced and seen, and our breadth of knowledge on particular subjects. And so I don't ever have enough information to judge somebody else's well, I just don't have it. I can say, oh yeah, that was a good book because it's my opinion that that book was filled with, you know, witty anecdotes or, you know, the characters were well thought out or, uh, uh, you know, a variety of different reactions that I could have. And that's what I think these people who leave reviews do. I mean, you know, they're allowed to think whatever it is about a book that they want to think. That's totally, that's allowed, right? But it doesn't, it feels like failure to the author, but that is simply because that reader did get it. They didn't get it. And it's okay that they didn't get it. I've had plenty of times where I have walked into a museum and seen a piece of modern art and gone, okay, so that pile of candy in the corner of the room goes for, I don't even know, like an astronomical dollar amount. And it's in the Chicago Art Institute. Like, wow. And I can look at that pile of candy and not have a clue what the artist's intention was. And you know, I feel like that's 
on me. It's not that that artist failed. Clearly that artist didn't fail. That artist is in the Chicago Art Institute, right? It's me who didn't get it. And I didn't get it because I didn't, you know, know what to look for. There were no suggestions made perhaps about what I was supposed to be looking for. Um, And I'm not trying to compare myself to an artist that is in the Chicago Art Institute. But what I am saying is communication via words, the art of words is always always going to look like failure to readers and feel like failure to authors if the message intended or the message received is not the same. I I hope this makes sense. Because writing is such a personal, fillet yourself open process, um, it is no wonder that not everybody is going to get it. I'm here to tell you I can go into a 12-step room and I can share an experience And the overarching gist of it, everybody can get. Everybody's kind of like, oh, I see what you're trying to say here, right? But they haven't lived it through my actual life circumstances prior to that moment um, with the players or, you know, the adults and children in that drama of my life, they're not going to see it exactly the way that I do. Just like I can watch a movie with my husband and he thinks it's fantastic and I don't. And sometimes we both think the same thing. We were both moved by it. So does that mean that that movie is better than some of the other movies? I guess. I don't really know, but I know that it's not super possible as a human to create these hits after hit after hit after hit where people get it and agree with it, right? Or people get it and are moved by it every time, every book, every piece of writing, every article. And so I think sometimes as as writers, we need to back up and we need to take that perspective of levitation where it's like, okay, I'm way too involved in the details right now. I'm way too, I'm way too micro. Like I need to get macro on this, right? And so that's more what I'm feeling today. Now, yesterday, I was curled up in a ball in bed, just going, I'm a hopeless failure and I suck. And, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I wasting my time and my life? Literally. Okay. It was like a big woe is me pity party for one. And then by the time I hit this morning and had really done some meditating on failure, perceived failure, right? Um, I had shifted to a point where I was like, all right, people don't get me. Like, that's okay. It is okay. Because I have wanted to be an author since I was a very young child. I've wanted to be an author. And today I am a published author, a self-published author. So maybe in some people's books, that doesn't count. But the beauty is I get to have full creative license over every project that I do. And I love that. And so in a way, I don't really give a shit about feedback because I think it's bullshit because I think feedback is, you know, it's opinions. I mean, I was in talking to the marketing department at uh, uh, the airline my husband works for this past summer, and they said the same thing about branding. They were like, oh, you know, put whatever it is in front of 25 people, you're going to get 25 different responses. There is not an end all be all you know, this is going to hit everybody and this is going to be the magic bullet. They're like, it doesn't exist. And so there isn't a right way, especially if it's your experience, your personal experience or your creative project, there isn't a right way to present that so that everybody will get it. I don't think. Okay, on that note, I'm going to start off by reading this quote and then I'm going to talk about it. This is by Stephen Marsh. 
on writing and failure, which I talked about at the beginning of this rant. He says, the internet loves to tell stories about famous writers facing adversity. What I find strange is that anyone finds it strange that there's so much rejection. The average telemarketer has to make 18 calls before finding someone willing to talk with him or her. And that is for shit people might need, like a vacuum cleaner or a new smartphone. Nobody needs a manuscript. I mean, right? (laughs) That's for shit people actually need. So for a creative process, no one needs it. Of course, they're going to be like, that's shitty or that's great. And it means nothing. It means nothing because it doesn't matter. Now, if your livelihood is going to be made on writing, it matters more. And that puts you kind of in the category of you must be writing to market, writing to sell, right? And if you're a creative type who is not doing that, expect rejection or perceived rejection. Expect failure, right? Like expect it. And I just didn't want to have, I don't know, I just don't want to have people put boundaries over what I should and shouldn't write and what's going to sell and what's not going to sell. And my entire goal, monetarily speaking, has just to been or just has been over time and still is to just break even, to just break even what I'm putting into this that I can pay for it. So I think it just takes having a reasonable goal and a reasonable expectation and to, you know, leave the rest out because none of those voices are going to change what I'm doing because If there are negative voices, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just not your cup of tea. That is okay. It's okay, but I'm not going to stop being me. It just, I'm compelled to write about my life experiences or adjacent to my life experiences because that's the only thing I know. It's the only thing I truly know. And if I'm not communicating that well, that's okay. It's truly okay because not everybody is going to get me just like I don't get everybody else. It's okay. And at the end of the day, what I love about writing and publishing is having books on the shelf that are told in my voice that are my creation with my artwork. That's what I want is to die and like, here's something I made, right? But I don't have control over it. Just like I've had eight kids, I don't have control over them. They're not my little projects. You know, they're not reflections of me. I birthed them and they're out in the world doing their thing. And that is the same exact thing that I've done with my books. I have birthed my books and they're out there in the world doing their thing, resonating or not. And it's not a reflection on me. It's just not. It's just not. Just like my kids aren't a reflection on me. You know, I mean, I had to let that go a long time ago and it's very freeing. My relationship with my writing is deeply personal and intertwined, as is my relationship with my children. Deeply personal, intertwined, inside jokes. Same with my writing. So as I wrap up, I want to read another piece of Stephen Marsh's on writing and failure. Okay, this starts on page 230 of his book. Well, it's 230 in um, an ebook, so I'm not sure if that's really what it is in a regular paperback. Fail better, Samuel Beckett commented, a phrase that has been taken on by business executives as some kind of wisdom. They miss Beckett's point. Beckett didn't mean failure on the way to delayed success, which is what the fail con crowd thinks he meant, thinks he meant, excuse me. To fail better, to fail gracefully and with composure is so essential because there's no such thing as success. It's failure all the way down. Writing itself is failure. Even the successes are failures. 
In the best work, the intentions of the author fall away, leaving an open field for readers to play in, and they create meanings that may have nothing to do with the authors. Jonathan Swift famously intended Gulliver's Travels as an indictment of all humanity, but ended up leaving a story for children. The joy of language is also a torment. Human speech is like a cracked kettle on which we tap crude rhythms for bears to dance to. Flaubert wrote, the quote continues, while we long to make music that will melt the stars. I love that. That's a great quote. Nobody knows what they're writing. Intention never aligns with result. You never know how readers will react. You never see how readers will react. It's all what quantum physicists call, quote, spooky action at a distance, unquote. And here we come to the real crux of the matter at last. The spirit and its daemon language live in failure. I am writing these words now in a dark morning a few days before Christmas. The air has the laden cold of Canadian winter, and I have draped myself in a blanket decorated with stitchwork constellations. A strange, sem- excuse me, I don't even know what this word is, um, semternal fog is lifting on the street. I like it though. It sounds good. Through a fragile and nebulous and, <clears throat> and tenuous network, these words have arrived with you. Perhaps you bought them. And then Stephen Marsh says, thank you, in parentheses. Perhaps you borrowed them. Perhaps you stole them. Perhaps a teacher forced them on you. Perhaps you're in jail. Perhaps you're in love. You might be reading them in a dorm room or the community space of an old folks home or on a beach in Belize or in the subway. Perhaps you're not reading these words at all because the publisher who commissioned them folded or refused them. I don't know. I can't know. That discrepancy is a torment and it is a thrill, that resonance that should be impossible. The reader has that thrill too. I know. John Keats wrote, quote, Ode on Melancholy, unquote, for me, which I highly recommend, by the way. Specifically, he wrote it for me at 15. He wrote it for a teenager in a sub in a city, in a country, none of which existed at the time of his writing. He may not have known it, but he did. And I do not know who I am writing this for, or for what time, or to what purpose. But there is a deep longing in me, and it's not a lie, not a fraud, to make these words for you. These connections are the substance of victory, to belong to a constellation of meanings to alleviate a specific minuscule cosmic loneliness. It seems like such a small satisfaction to expand your life on. Expend your life on, excuse me. It isn't. You ask, why send my scribbles? Ovid, in his exile, asked, because... I want to be with you somehow, somehow, anyhow. No whining, no complaining. Shakespeare died with unproduced plays, with manuscripts he had worked on, burned to nothing and lost forever. Why should it be any different for you? This business leaves everyone, every last one, ragged. So I might do a series on this because there's a lot of different writers that he talks about in this book too. Um, You know, J.K. Rowling and Herman Melville and there are just a lot of things to unpack. But the bottom line is we put something out there. Every day we have conversations. We say things. We have one intent. Somebody hears something totally different. As far as I understand it, this is the basis of like why people practice Socratic seminars, right? Because if they're coming at an issue from opposing views, One person needs to articulate what they think that person's opposing view is. And then the other person needs to say, yes, that is what I mean. Or no, that's not what I mean. I mean this. So they have to understand what the other person is talking about exactly before they can even debate the issue. And we don't get that as authors and readers. We don't have that back and forth discourse. That is accomplished through conversation, not through some cheap, phony, flippant comments or forum, chat room banter, right? Or reviews. It's just not accomplished 
through that. I'm here to tell you I read, and I'll wrap it up finally with this, is I will read Amazon reviews until the cows come home about a product. And for every, oh, this is the wonderful product of the century, the most, you know, life-changing thing ever made. Then there's somebody else who's like, it sucked. And here's why. And they'll list a whole different, like a group of reasons that are important to that person. And so I leave you with this. Writing is failure. Being human is failure. And I guess we're left to redefine what that word failure even means. Was it my job to, I mean, I'm not a tech writer. I'm not writing instructions on how to assemble an Ikea piece of furniture. And if you don't get the desired result, then I've failed. You know, I mean, this is art. This is an art form. This is words in art through my voice and my experience. And so I think we need to look at redefining what that word actually is, failure, what the word success actually is. And there's not going to be one answer. It will be different for everybody because we're different human beings. We're from the same species, but we're totally different. We have different back backgrounds, viewpoints. We have different experiences. So of course it stands to reason. We're going to have different opinions. Sometimes they match up by a stroke of luck and sometimes they don't, but neither one is a quote unquote failure or a success unless we've attached meaning to those words and define them in certain ways. Well, on that note, that's what's on my mind today. Remember to be kind, rewind. Thank you for the honor of your time. Take what you like and just freaking leave the rest behind. Thank you so much for listening to Eternally Amy, a mom of eight's journey from jail to joy. Amy Liz Harrison is a best-selling author, speaker, 12-step coach, meditation teacher, and recovery advocate. To find out more, please visit amylizharrison.com. You can keep up with Amy on all platforms by following at Amy Liz Harrison. Please subscribe and review this podcast. It means so much to us if you do.